I'm in the Jodrell Laboratory in the Royal Botanic Gardens at Kew. It's a modern lab full of rows of gleaming white super cold freezers humming away. And it's a place where 20 years ago, the way we look at and understand the world of plants began to change forever. Our growing understanding of genetics started to revolutionise botany too. DNA analysis threw up some startling new insights into the nature of plant species and went on to cause some major readjustments to the neat ordering of plant classifications held in the serried rows of cabinets in the Kew Herbarium. Professor Mark Chase is director of the Jodrell Laboratory and was in on that process at the start. Mark, what would we see if we opened one of these super cool freezers? Inside we have little trays filled with about three centimeter tall little tubes, each tube containing a liquid specimen in the bottom of it and that's the DNA of a separate plant. So what goes on in this laboratory? Those DNA samples are used as the basis for sequencing particular genes. We work right across the board. There's really no group of plants that we're not interested in. Well, today, Kew's DNA bank is the oldest and largest of its kind in the world, holding over 42,000 samples. The taxonomy of plants will never be the same again. Well, Professor Chase and I have stepped away from the Jodrell Laboratory and now we've been joined by Professor Dave Simpson, who's acting keeper of the Kew Herbarium and Library and Art and Archives. And Dave, you are yourself a taxonomist. When this new approach based upon DNA first became apparent in the 1990s, were you aware of its significance? Well, I think as a what you might call traditional plant taxonomist, we were very much working in the traditional mould, so we were looking at characters and working out relationships based on the morphology. That's where our focus was in the herbarium. So I certainly was aware of these developments in DNA, but I think at that time we weren't too strongly aware of the impact it would have on the way we group plants, the way we classify plants. Now, presumably in the early 90s, this was a moment of tremendous developments in the study of genetics. Yes, it was. It was just when things began to speed up. Prior to that time, the technology was so primitive that you spent a whole year producing just one DNA sequence. And concurrent with the speeding up of the production of DNA sequences was the improvement in the software technology that you needed to analyze these data. When we first started to run these large data matrices, the computers crashed because they couldn't handle that much information in a single analysis. So the process got faster and cheaper, you could handle vast amounts of data more quickly, you could start to assemble a meaningful database. Exactly. If you were going to look at all the families of plants, then you had to have in excess of 500 sequences. And the other question, of course, was, was this going to tell us anything about the higher level relationships or was it just going to give us rubbish? And when we published the first really big paper in 1993, all of us had serious questions about how meaningful this was really going to turn out to be. What were some of the findings that startled you? Some of the things were so surprising that we doubted them ourselves. We had to go back and resequence some of the things because we thought somebody for sure must have messed the tubes up. The classic one, of course, is the plane tree and the lotus and the protea family. Nobody would ever have dreamed that those species would be related to each other. Things like the fairly close relationship of the rose family with the nettles, that really startled people. And the fact that papayas were related to cabbages, whereas everyone always before thought they would be related to the passion fruit. None of the classifications that had been based on morphology had ever thought that these things would be related as they turned out to be. So something's changed to make them diverge. What's going on there? The simple explanation is that two relatives take different paths and become adapted for different ecologies. So, the example we've already talked about, the lotus and the plane tree. They shared a common ancestor, but since they split off from each other, one has become a terrestrial tree, the other has become an aquatic herb, and it was that divergence in their form, due to adaptation to different ecologies, that completely had hidden their shared relationship. And it wasn't until the DNA showed us that that anybody had any idea that it would be possible. Dave is a taxonomist. How radical were these new revelations? Well, certainly they were radical in the sense that it means that we've had to adapt our taxonomies and even adapt the way we organise the collections in the herbarium. So there's a lot of re-cataloguing going on and reclassifying. Well, yes, and we currently are doing a re-cataloguing of the collections of the herbarium. This is a three-year project, basically to move seven million specimens around so that it corresponds now with the new DNA classification. 
How has the scientific community managed to keep up with that? I mean, certainly in the early days, I think people didn't really believe what they were seeing. But as the data sets have built up over the years, I think people have become much more accepting of the, of the results that are coming out. The thoughts that we've been having about relationships over 200 or so years are now more or less reflected with a lot of what's coming out of the DNA work. Well, discovering that a nettle is related to a rose or an orchid to an asparagus or an onion is startling and fascinating. Why is it important? What does the new approach of understanding a plant's DNA tell us that's useful? Classification isn't just for the herbarium taxonomist. It's used by scientists everywhere. If, for example, you're wanting to study how nitrogen fixation in legumes, the, the bean family, came about. It's a tremendously useful characteristic yes, of plants. Fixing nitrogen means you don't have to supply nitrogen fertilizer, which is becoming increasingly expensive. So if we could engineer plants or breed plants to be able to do this, it'd be a great advantage. And unless you have an accurate idea of which ones are related, you can't begin to answer those kinds of questions. What other insights into the way that plants have evolved did the understanding of their DNA show us? Well, one of the very interesting things about DNA is that the change in the DNA sequences is relatively clock-like. When people first started to play with that idea, it occurred to them that if you could calibrate that change with a fossil of a known age, then you would be able to set the clock to a specific rate. And when you could do that, then you could estimate the ages of things that you didn't know. For instance, we have palm fossils from about 92 million years ago. So the palm family has to be at least 92 million years old. Therefore, all the change we see between the palms and their closest relatives has happened in the last 92 million years. So you divide that number of changes in the DNA sequences by 92 million years, and you get a rate of change in the gene. So two plants are proven through DNA to be distant cousins. Yeah. We know that somewhere there's a common ancestor, and that's fixed by what the fossil record tells us. That's correct. We can back time from the present to that moment fixed in time by fossils and work out a kind of clock for the, way, the rate at which evolution has yeah, happened. We can re work out the rate at which it's ticking. We're also at a moment when the rate of plant extinction is perhaps higher than it's ever been. Is it going to help us understand in it, terms of conservation in, in, more? Indeed it does. What we're particularly interested in is the impact of what climate change may do to plants and their distributions. Of course, if we understand how past climate change has affected plant distributions, we can start to model the sorts of things we might expect for the future. So what began with the first step in the Jodrell Laboratory 20 years ago sounds like a journey that's only just begun. In some senses, yes. If we're going to solve a lot of the problems we have today, we have to understand how to handle our natural world better, and particularly the plants.